Drama in South Africa as former President Jacob Zuma walks out of the corruption inquiry while the current president is also accused. Nicaraguans begin to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the victory of the Sandinista Revolution. And Brazil's landless movement calls protests after an attack killed one of its members and injured 10. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Doris Polo in Quito and this is From the South. We begin in South Africa, where the former president, Jacob Zuma, has said he will no longer take part in an inquiry into state corruption. After five days of hearings, the deputy justice minister has adjourned the public inquiry while efforts are made to persuade Zuma to return to give evidence. The former president has been accused of using his office to develop an elaborate web of corruption, much of it centered on his friends in the Gupta family. Earlier, his lawyer said that Zuma's withdrawal was not a sign of disrespect. My client has instructed me that he will take no further part in these proceedings. He respected you, he still does, he respects this commission, but the com commission does not seem to know its ground rules. At the same time, South Africa's anti-corruption watchdog has accused the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, of deliberately misleading parliament. It says he violated the constitution and breached the executive ethics code when he failed to tell Parliament last November about a $36,000 contribution campaign to lead the African National Congress. From Pretoria, our correspondent Matuba Malachi has the latest. So it's been a busy news day here in South Africa with political drama unfolding all sides, starting with former President Jacob Zuma arriving at the State Capture Commission of Inquiry and announcing that he would no longer, no longer participate in that process. Pre former President Jacob Zuma has been unhappy with the commission's conduct, uh, saying that it's been treated like a court of law rather than a commission of inquiry. His counsel had been unhappy with the line of questioning, saying President Jacob Zuma is being treated unfairly. Now, the Commission Chair, Raymond Zondo, the Deputy Chief Justice, who's presiding over this process, has intervened in this impasse, asking former President Jacob Zuma to reconsider his position. And he did indeed change his mind and saying that he will continue to give testimony and the proceedings adjourned until Monday. Another political drama unfolding is with regards to President Solo Ramaphosa, who's the current president, uh, when he became president, he ran a campaign to become president of the African National Congress, the party that he is representing. And in that campaign, he got a donation of about 35 US dollars. That's 500,000 South African rands. This controversial uh, donation was made by a controversial company called Busasa. And the public protector believes that the president misled parliament and the public protector when he told his version on how he got the funds into his campaign. Therefore, the public protector has found that the president has violated the constitution and the ethics code. Now, it remains to be seen if this will amount to any consequences for the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, and he is also yet to respond to, to uh, Friday's announcement by the public prote protector that he has violated the constitution. The last time we saw a, scen a scenario like this was when President Jacob Zuma was a sitting president and he was found by the same office of the public protector that he had violated the constitution. And this was a build up to him being forced to resign. And it, it's, it's a completely scenario now with President Cyril Ramaphosa being told that he had violated the constitution. But the consequences thereof are unknown at this point. That was Matuba Malaji with that report. Now, Nicaragua is celebrating 40 years since the triumph of, of the Sandinista popular revolution. Sandinistas from all around the country are pouring into Managua Bay by caravan, having set out last night and in the early morning. A massive celebration is set to take place at the Plaza La Fe this afternoon. They're not only commemorating the historic occasion, 
This year is of particular meaning as the country defeated the latest attempt at foreign intervention in 2018. We spoke with Nicaragua's Minister Advisor for International Affairs and the Caribbean regarding this important commemoration. He told us about the biggest achievements in Nicaragua since the triumph of the revolution. We are the safest country in the region, for example. We were able to, to slash poverty in two-thirds over the last 10 years. We had grown at 5% uh, 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 average a year for the last 10 years. Those are very important because then we are capable, or we have been capable to deliver free and quality education, free and quality uh, health care, free uh, uh, access and access to many of the fundamental infrastructure. The revolution is a process, it's a continuum. It's a continuum by which the popular movement that in our country, for example, that Sandino was the first time in history that the leader of the uprising, in this case, uh, Sandino, was, came from the popular movement and defeated the empire. It's a continuum that takes us to the founding of the Sandinista Front. It's a continuum that takes us to the defeat of the dictatorship and the defeat of the intervention in the 1980s. It's a continuum that took us to struggle during the neoliberal counter-revolutionary process between the 90s and 2006. And it's a continuum that moved forward to continue building a country, a country that's independent, a country that is capable uh, within its sovereignty to build well-being, to build, to build a communication, to build relationship with everyone in the world. And I think, that is what you will see forward. We will continue to implement those fundamental elements of the revolution. Grenada's Minister of Agriculture and Lands has expressed concern about the agriculture sector. She cited land degradation, the lack of sustainable farming practices, climatic variations and droughts as the main problems. She was speaking on world day to combat desertification and drought as she explained its importance. It isn't just about sand. It isn't an isolated issue that will quietly disappear. And it isn't someone else's problem. It is about restoring and protecting the fragile layer of land, which only covers a third of the earth, but which can either alleviate or accelerate the double-edged crisis facing our biodiversity and our climate. It is important to note that Grenada has been spearheading the fight against desertification at local, regional, and global levels. Some of the actions we have taken include Cabinet's approval of Grenada's voluntary land de degradation neutrality, targets 2030. Authorities in Haiti, in cooperation with the United Nations Mission for the Support of Peace and Justice, have destroyed hundreds of guns seized from criminals. The weapons were destroyed at an event that took place at the National Police Academy in the capital, Port-au-Prince. Obsolete police arms were also destroyed at the same event. The exercise is part of efforts to reduce gang violence and drug trafficking. The PNH had initiated the process of destruction of obsolete arms in the institution. In addition to those seized during operations, Today, under your watchful eyes, we will destroy some in front of you. It is very little, but it is significant. Guyana's very first oil production vessel is expected to arrive in the country in September. The Lisa Destiny departed Singapore on Thursday. It is owned by multinational oil and gas corporation ExxonMobil. The vessel has the production capacity of 120,000 barrels of oil per day and an average storage volume of 1.6 million. With the development of oil, Guyana is said to be the fastest growing economy in the world, with its GDP increasing from US $3.4 billion in 2016 to $13 billion by 2025. We'll take a short break now. Don't go away.
Welcome back. The Brazilian Landless Workers Movement is calling a protest in the Valinos region of Sao Paulo after one of its members was run over and killed on Thursday. Ten other activists were injured in the attack, which the movement believes was a hate crime encouraged by the government. It was 8 in the morning in Valinos, and a thousand families from the Mariel camp of the Landless Workers Movement were handing out food and protesting. They've been occupying this idle land for a year. Suddenly, a pickup truck raced along the road towards them. Apparently, the driver was armed. He ran over 10 of the activists, including a 72-year-old bricklayer, Luis Ferreira. He bled to death as he arrived at the hospital. He has spent his whole life working, struggling and suffering for this country, and with so many kids around. A coward comes and does this. We are very sad. This has hit us really hard. The members of the MST had been demonstrating to demand their water supply be turned back on. It had been cut off by the mayor of Valencia a region where agribusiness and gated communities consume large amounts of water. It's an hour and a half from Sao Paulo, the richest city in South America. Every day, Uriel spends an hour fetching water for his home. It's very difficult. When we had water, it was easier. They cut it off and everything got a lot worse. You can't live without water. Amid all the grief, the landless movement pointed to the federal government's responsibility in this crime, and they want justice from the local authorities. What happened here has a direct link to the political situation in Brazil today. President Jair Bolsonaro and the governor of Sao Paulo, Jao Doria, are responsible for this climate of hate. They have encouraged Brazilians to attack the social movements. The police have arrested a suspect who has confessed to the crime. The movement has called a protest in the region to protest against the wave of violence in the countryside. In Chile, more than 400 teachers have marched in Valparaíso and Viña del Mar to show their support for the nationwide strike, which has already been going on for seven weeks. Teachers have been on strike since early June, after the National Teachers Union had recently rejected 80% majority the government's latest proposal to change their working conditions. Until now, Education Minister Marcela Cubilos hasn't reached out to the strikers to restart negotiations. A parliamentary commission in Argentina has concluded that the Ara San Juan submarine tragedy a year and a half ago was the result of defense budget cuts. Lawmakers say the lack of funding meant the submarine hadn't been maintained properly. They also question the way President Mauricio Macri and his defense minister handled the incident. The Ara San Juan with a crew of 44 vanished in November 2017 as it sailed back to its base in the port of Mar del Plata. It was found almost a year later at 800 meters deep in Patagonia. The lack of budget resources during several different administrations, the absence of a technological update and insufficient maintenance according to the vessel's hours of use produced a worsening degradation of the tools narrowing its operability. The main responsibility always falls on people who are sitting behind a desk, who do not have any idea what a submarine is and do not know about the dangers a submarine faces. The men were passionate about their job and they always used to carry parts with them because the submarine used to break easily, just like that. A lesbian couple has married in the city of Guayaquil in the first same-sex wedding since Ecuador legalized it last month. Alexandra Chavez and Michelle Aviles were wed at the civil registry office and said they will celebrate the occasion later this year. Their wedding comes after Ecuador's constitutional court granted two gay couples the right to marry 
following a lengthy legal battle in June. So far, same-sex marriage is legal only in six countries in Latin America. I feel more support from the laws. I know that many people don't see this as right and are not going to see this as right. But we aren't hurting anybody and we don't take anything away from anybody. And this is normal life for anyone else. Shifting gears now, over one million eligible voters have registered for Bolivia's upcoming general elections, which marks a record compared with previous elections. The registration process was carried out across Bolivia and in 33 other countries. It was geared toward young people who will turn 18 years old by the October 20th election and for people who have moved or migrated. There has been an increase in voting registration, which led us to deduce that Bolivians living abroad are interested in the activities and processes that we are developing. In the 45 days of registration, 1,086,177 people were registered. This figure exceeds the expectations and results of previous processes. For example, in 2016, 28,000 people were registered abroad, and now we have 96,000 people registered. This increase in voter registration was highlighted to demonstrate the success of a prolonged promotion to encourage people to actively participate in the electoral process to select the president, vice president, deputies, and senators. The process will end on October 20th. It not only identifies the work that we undertaken during this massive registration period, but it showcases previous planning. We've been updating the school records. We've also been working abroad with permanent records. This registration result is more than half the usual average. In the last electoral process, more than 6 million and 200,000 people were eligible to vote. This year, the figure is expected to approach 7 million. A total of nine fronts and political parties are participating in the elections. More stories coming up when we come back. Iran says the U.S. might have shot one of its own drones, mistaking it for theirs. Stay with us. We are present at every event of what our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Italian court has overturned all charges against the German captain Carola Rackett and set her free. She was being charged with aiding illegal immigration. Rackett, who captained the migrant rescue ship Sea Watch 3 with over 40 migrants aboard, was detained after refusing to comply with a ban on entering Italy's territorial waters. Yes, it's very important for me to underline that it should not be about me as a person. It should be about the fact that we have thousands of refugees in a country which is at war from where they should urgently be evacuated. And I expect, especially from the European Commission, that they quickly agree how these both refugees will be distributed in Europe. We have Heidi Sadiq from Sea-Watch to discuss the ruling and the consequences it could have for their humanitarian week. Hello, Heidi. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you. So my first question to, to you. What was the reaction of your organization to the news that Carola won't be jailed for aiding migrants? So actually, our captain Carola Rocchetta is still facing investigations by the prosecutors in Italy. Uh, her house arrest was lifted a few weeks ago after she was arrested and taken off our ship. 
uh, even before the 40 people we had rescued could uh, disembark. Uh, so actually, the prosecutors are still looking to see if there is enough legal grounds to take this to trial. Um, but uh, it's, it's not over for Carola yet. But one of the judges who basically did not validate her arrest did make some very strong uh, comments uh, about the fact that everything that she has done and that under her command uh, of the Sea Watch 3, we fully upheld the law and everything we did was to protect uh, the well being of the guests that we had on board. So, actually, uh, the reaction from Sea Watch is that this is heading in the right direction uh, and we expect that this will actually not. Uh, go to trial, and that it will be acknowledged, uh, even if it comes in the court of law, that everything we have done is entirely lawful. So, what does this ruling mean for the other organizations working to rescue migrants in the Mediterranean? Well, it means uh, the same for all of us. Uh, the Sea Watch 3, the ship, still remains under probationary confiscation in Italy as long as these investigations are ongoing. So what it practically means is that we cannot resume our rescue operations until that uh, confiscation is lifted. And a similar strategy is adopted by EU governments uh, across the civil uh, rescue organizations uh, who are conducting rescue in the Mediterranean, which is to try and hinder them by all possible means. And whether that means legal challenges or you know, criminal charges, uh, false accusations being made against captains and other crew, or if it's administrative um, hurdles, for example, extra safety regulations or confiscating ships to practically keep people at bay and keep them from arriving on European soil. And that policy is deadly because while we are stuck in a port, there remains a huge rescue gap in the Mediterranean and people continue to drown. So how do you expect the Italian government to respond? Well, what we've received in terms of response from the Italian government so far is um, a systematic crackdown and basically spearheading this EU policy uh, of criminalizing the rescuer. Uh, and so we don't expect this to tone down uh, and we don't, you know, the, the recent standoff of us being um, in front of Lampedusa for 17 days waiting for Italy to take its responsibility, that is the new trend which uh, is being spearheaded by Minister Salvini, whose slogan is the ports are closed. Um, we don't think that this intimidation or criminalization uh, uh, should be enough to shut us down and we will continue to find ways to um, continue our rescue operation because the humanitarian incentive and the emergency still persists in the Mediterranean. And we urge that the European Union, including the Italian government uh, as a member state and as a coastal state, take up their legal obligation to coordinate rescues and ensure that they end in people reaching a port of safety, which is definitely not Libya. Thank you so much, Heidi, for joining us and best wishes to you as you continue on your journey. Thank you very much. Iran has denied that a U.S. warship shot down one of its drones in the Strait of Hormuz. Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps released a footage in which it shows a U.S. drone monitoring the USS Boxer through the street. President Donald Trump had announced on Thursday that the craft was destroyed, but Iran's deputy foreign minister said the U.S. might have shut down its own drone by mistake. According to Iran's state media, the armed forces said all such aircrafts had returned safely to their bases. Meanwhile, two Iranian vessels carrying corn are stranded in Brazil following their failure to refuel due to U.S. sanctions. The ships have been marooned in port of Paranagua since the first week of July after state oil company Petrobras declined to sell fuel to them, citing U.S. sanctions. The Iranian government has in the past said the sanctions are making it difficult for ordinary people to access basic needs such as food. The 41-year-old suspect in the Japanese arson attack at an animation studio which killed 33 people has confessed to the crime. Shinji Aoba reportedly told police he did it because he believed the Kyoto animation studio had stolen his novel. However, police could not question him as he was hospitalized and under anesthesia due to the burns he suffered. As such, he has not yet been arrested. On Thursday, Aoba wheeled a trolley carrying at least one bucket of petrol 
into the studio's entrance before dousing the area while shouting, die. The blaze also injured 36 people. Thousands of South Korean trade union members have gathered in front of the National Assembly building to protest against the government's labor policies. The Korean Confederation of Trade Unions has called on the government to cancel labor law reforms, which they say would worsen working conditions. Unions also want large firms to be reformed and the minimum wage to be raised to $8.50 per hour, which President Moon Jae-in had promised to implement by 20 2020. Some 50,000 union members joined demonstrations held nationwide. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in South Africa, remember you can find us on Stasa Channel in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And join us on social media. For Dallas English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.